So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this talk in series on the sacraments. We have Dr. Robert Evans today, and I'll hand over to George in a moment to introduce him. But first of all, a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that in this wonderful sacrament, you have given us the memorial of your passion. Grant us so to reverence the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may know within ourselves and show forth in our lives the fruits of your redemption. For you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So welcome, Robert and George, over to you. Yes, indeed. Uh, welcome to everybody to this uh, session in our series on the sacraments. And obviously a special welcome to uh, Robert, uh, Dr. Robert Evans, uh, who uh, until a few years ago was a uh, senior lecturer at the uh, University of Chester in uh, New Testament studies, uh, and now an honorary senior lecturer in the department there. Um, and uh, Robert has been part of uh, this uh, Bible Talks team uh, for a number of years now. Uh, he's a great expert on um, BSL, British Sign Language, uh, and uh, working um, on uh, Bible translation um, in that respect as a retirement hobby, I think, um, but perhaps more than a hobby. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you with us, Robert, and we uh, very much look forward to your talk uh, which covers the topic of ordination, uh, holy orders and New Testament patterns of ministry. Over to you. I'll share my screen and set the show running. There's something up here on my screen to make life easier. The Book of Common Prayer says, it is evident to all people diligently reading Holy Scripture that from the Apostles' time there have been bishops, priests, and deacons. And the Church of England had particular reasons in the controversies of its day to make that claim. Today I'm going to explore with you a question that it provokes. How far or in what ways did these roles and titles, bishop, priest, and deacon, originate in the earliest churches and in the time of the apostles. Many of us will remember Loveday's lecture of 10 years ago. Are there any bishops in the Bible? She asked provocatively. I've opened with the same quotation that she used. I'll be covering some of the same ground though much more cursorily and without uh, maintaining Loveday's focus on episcopacy. I shall also ask, are there any Christian priests in the Bible and what about deacons? Um, I, perhaps I should say I speak as a deacon and priest of the Church of England uh, myself. For instance, we seem to have in 1 Timothy a character description for an episkopos, meaning an overseer. And the Greek word episkopos gives us our English word bishop. The same passage has a character description for, a, for diakonoi, meaning servants, and giving us our word deacons. Later, in the same letter, we read about presbuteroi, uh, meaning elders or older people, and giving us our word presbyters. This word presbyteros also gives us our word priest, so a priest in the New Testament was something different. The ordinal that we use today covers a complicated history when it says priests, also called presbyters. Uh, more of that later. But have we got enough here in 1 Timothy to agree with the Book of Common Prayer preface? Is this evidence in scripture of bishops, deacons and presbyters in the time of the apostles? Did they mean what we mean? We're going to have to investigate further. The question is part of a larger one. How did we get from where we began to where we are? Jesus sent out his followers to proclaim God's rule. We have today mostly parish priests who are managing a church or a network of congregations and churches. When did that happen? And what connects how we began and how we are now? I shall concentrate, of course, on the very earliest parts of that journey. It's a long journey. 
the earliest people we hear about as witnesses to the risen Christ are in Luke's account in Acts, in the churches of Judea and the mission beyond it. And we hear about three roles in particular, apostles, prophets, who are the first generation, uh, sorry, uh, uh, apostles uh, 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 as the first generation evangelists, prophets, speaking God's word to believers, often uh, uh, certainly in Acts as words of encouragement, uh, an early form of preaching. And there were elders of whom more later. To put this in a timeline, these roles operated uh, in the mission of the Jerusalem church from the early 30s to 70 CE, when the believers centered there are dispersed along with uh, so many other Jews. Within the same period, mid thirties to early sixties, Paul's mission gives us our earliest surviving documents about congregations in the diaspora. Apostles and prophets again head this list. And in a couple of places, we hear about a sort of triad, apostles, prophets and teachers. Teachers are another important role in the new congregations. But each list of ministries that we get to see in Paul's network is different. It looks as if patterns of ministry were far from being consolidated or universalized across all the missions and uh, congregations. This list in Roman, for instance, includes the ministries of prophets and teachers, but also has serving, encouraging, giving, leading, exercising mercy. And in the Pauline networks, as for Luke, these are gifts of the spirit. All believers have different gifts for the common good. Another group we learn about in Paul's mission are householders who are hosts to the congregations. We know the names of several of them. I've selected a married couple, Aquila and Prisca, a woman, Nympha, a man, Philemon. Did these have duties, responsibilities, ministries? What were they? Congregations meeting in someone's house raise a feature of developing organisation and uh, concerns the maximum size of a, a congregation. In whatever space they met within someone's house, Congregations can't really have been bigger than about 40 or 50 people. The largest hospitality space in most townhouses was the atrium, like the one shown here. Some houses included a, a large workshop, and that's another possibility for a place to assemble. But in any such space in a house, once the mission in a town drew in more than 40 or 50 people, there would have to be more than one congregation and more than one householder playing host. So was there some sort of overall organisation to these or not yet? Early congregations met in people's houses and the letter to the Ephesians gives us the analogy of the church as the household of God. How did being like a household affect the development of leadership of churches? How did that characterise its officers? More of this later. A particular question of when did certain things develop is posed by the dating of the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus. If these letters are by Paul, they'd have to have been written in the year or two before he was executed. But a high proportion of scholarship, almost all of us, and for a whole nexus of reasons, believe that the circumstances reflected in these letters are, are uh, those of communities 20 or 30 years after Paul. They're written by one or more of his followers in his name. They are still scripture, though we don't know the author. They're as much holy scripture as texts written by Paul or Luke or other authors whose identities we don't always know. It would be a mistake to see the patterns of ministry in this strand of the tradition in 85 to 95 and imagine that those were the patterns and norms of Paul's earlier congregations. There are very obvious differences. The ethos in the pastorals is one of male authority exclusively. In Paul's congregations, there were women evangelizing, teaching and preaching. And the strong charismatic character of gifts, gifts to all believers, isn't present in the pastorals. There may be lots of reasons for this. My main point is that things were different at different times and in different places. And here, 
I've stretched out the timeline a bit more. You can see that Paul's activities and the congregations that Luke writes about are in the first half of the New Testament period, and the pastoral letters are in the second half. There's another letter, not part of New Testament scriptures, but written within the New Testament period, written by Ignatius, Episcopos in Antioch in about 110, and he's writing to believers in the city of uh, Agnesia. And he's concerned for harmony and unity. He urges them to recognize the authority of one Episcopos in that place. The implication is that there isn't to be an overseer in each congregation, but one such person is to have oversight over more than one congregation. His words are quite something. Your bishop presides in the place of God and elders in the place of the council of the apostles and deacons are entrusted with the ministry of Jesus Christ. There's lots we might discuss. This is a real top-down hierarchy. But my point is to show how there was development and change over time. If Ignatius is telling the Magnesians to acknowledge one Episcopos, it is a certainty that not everybody previously was. You, you don't tell people to do something if they're all already doing it. And I can show you that earlier there were congregational overseers who didn't have that multi-congregational position. So you can see, I hope, how our passage in 1 Timothy is in between the earliest patterns and roles in the Jerusalem church and Paul's mission and the later ones after the New Testament. During the developments, different congregations and networks may have had different roles or different names for the same roles. I want to take us back to that passage in 1 Timothy and try to see it in that light. And the first question is Loveday's famous one. Are there any bishops in the Bible? And the start of a 10 is, should we be translating that word episkopos as bishop when it's applied to the New Testament period? And most of us think not. Older translations like King James did translate it as bishop and the NRSV follows that tradition. But most or all, I think, other recent scholarly English translations use a different word, usually overseer. If we translate it as bishop, we're reading back later circumstances and our assumptions about bishops into earlier practice, and that's likely to be misleading. And the New Testament is not overflowing with these individuals, whatever we call them. There are five instances of the word episcopus in the Bible. In 1 Peter, it describes Jesus. He's the shepherd and overseer of our lives. So not there, somebody who's a church officer. In Acts, it comes in a speech that Luke gives to Paul, addressing the elders of Ephesus. He says, the spirit has given you, the elders, oversight of God's flock. So it's not Paul promoting a bunch of presbyters all to be bishops. As elders, their role is being overseers. It looks as if Luke or his sources may not know a category of leaders called overseers distinct from those people called elders. Maybe they had different names in different places. So perhaps only three of these instances of the word refer to the title of a church role. And two of them are in the later practice of the congregations of the pastoral letters. And Paul uses it just once, or in the letters that we have, writing to the congregation or congregations at Philippi. Can you see it's plural, overseers, and what that means? Paul doesn't have in mind one episcopos in a city, the multi-congregational role that we get later in Ignatius. For Paul, there are several overseers in the one or more congregations of Philippi. He doesn't mean what Ignatius later meant by that role. To summarize. Three references to the office of overseer for, if you count the one in Acts. Bishop is probably the wrong word to use. We're not there yet. And there could have been some crossover between what some congregations called an elder and what others called an overseer in different times and places. Next question is where do elders come in the New Testament? Presbyteros is a frequent word. 
but the commonest use is for uh, community leaders in the Sanhedrin, a central council, including chief priests and teachers of the law. Synagogues too could have councils of elders, and it's not just a Jewish thing, just about every Greek and Roman town had council of elders. It was a very common provision of male community leaders in the ancient world. And so we read that the Jerusalem church had elders. Luke writes about decisions taken by the apostles and the elders. And some other texts refer to groups of elders in the Christian communities, James, 1 Peter, and in Revelation. Having a, a council of elders for Christian congregation might have been a pattern influenced by the way things were organized in synagogues. For predominantly Jewish Christian communities, it was probably a, a go-to structure. Luke says that Paul appointed elders, and he may have done, but Paul never uses the word in the letters that we've got. It may be that this is the word that Luke uses as the role familiar to him, where Paul might have used a different word, like overseers, different times, different places, different names, maybe. Is it accidental that Paul doesn't use the word in his letters? Women were prominent among the people exercising all the ministries in Paul's networks. It is hard to see how a traditional male council would have a role in those settings. But that's a speculation, and we really don't know. Right. Some congregations have councils of elders. Paul's communities probably don't. But here's my acknowledgement of the elephant in the room, because the Book of Common Prayer preface says, scripture shows that from the beginning there was an order of priests. We found presbyters, or elders, in some Christian congregations, where do we look for the priests? It's a different Greek word, kierios. It means someone who performs rites of sacrifice. And the priests in the New Testament are priests of the Jerusalem temple, the officials who make the offerings at the altar, that is sacrificing incense, doves, goats, sheep, etc. Then by analogy, the word is applied to Jesus in the letter to the Hebrews. While every priest stands day after day offering again and again the same sacrifices in the temple, Jesus offered for all time a single sacrifice. So by comparison and contrast, Jesus is a priest. This has a really significant impact on Christian thought and practice. The third use is for describing the whole people of God as a royal priesthood and holy nation. And out of references in 1 Peter and Revelation, we've made the phrase the priesthood of all believers. All this together means that hierius is never used in the New Testament to mean individual Christian ministers. So hierius and presbyteros are two different words meaning different things. Priests performed sacrifices in the temple, while some congregations, Jewish or Christian, had councils of elders. But in English and several other languages, presbyter and priest both come from the same word. I don't know if, if my grid at the bottom there will help you see that, but the idea of what a priest is comes from the different role called hierius in the New Testament, sacerdos in Latin. This journey is long and complicated, and I can hardly do it justice here. But I'll just start with the New Testament end. If we call someone a priest, it's because they're performing a sacrificial rite. That's what it means. So is anyone doing that? in Christian communities. Very early on, believers gathered and they broke bread and they proclaimed the Lord's death until he comes. And they repeat Jesus' words from the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. Theologically, the person breaking bread and proclaiming the Lord's death is not making a new sacrifice we are representing the sacrifice made by Jesus once, only once and once for all. But if one has to find a single reason for calling a minister a priest, this is arguably the core of it. And I'm very conscious that some other people and other denominations might put this very differently. Forgive the speed here. 
But the next question from a New Testament perspective is who was it in the early congregations who broke the bread and proclaimed the Lord's death? The role that later we call priest. After the New Testament period, uh, there was a presbyter, elder for each congregation, and they presided at the table. Before that, within the New Testament, some places might have had elders who may have done this. But someone was breaking bread and proclaiming the Lord's death when there weren't officers called elders. Who was presiding then? One guess would be that it might sometimes or regularly have been the host of the congregation, the woman or man in whose house they were having this meal. But that's a guess. We really don't know. Next question is when, and this is after the New Testament period, was hierius in Greek or sacerdos in Latin used to describe a Christian minister? And there are records of this happening third or fourth century. It was probably piecemeal and incremental and developed over time. The final question is that linguistic one. Why have we got two words from one word and when does that happen? In English, I can tell you precisely if I go back to my first academic field, Old English, Anglo-Saxon, has a word prest from the Latin, and it means presbyter or elder. Old English also had the word sacred from sacerdos, Latin. So preost meant presbyter, sacred meant priest. But by early Middle English, people have stopped using the word sacred, and we find the word preost being used for the sacrificial role as well as for presbyter or elder. Uh, later with English translations of the Bible, the word presbyter comes into the language directly from the Greek to sort of disambiguate. It's fascinating, but definitely offers room for confusion. Similar things happened in some, not all, European languages. But this is all later on. The New Testament end of it is clear enough. Some congregations have councils of elders. Paul's communities probably don't. And they're not called priests that came later. But some people, right from the beginning, were breaking bread, representing the sacrifice of Christ. We've had elders then since some early congregations. The Book of Common Prayer preface can certainly claim that. But as with bishops, or should it be overseers, we're reading back a later development if we call them priests from the start. And even to call them presbyters, could be to read back what we think presbyters are into the functions that elders had then. Is it going to be more straightforward when we look for deacons? You must be hoping so. If I asked you who thinks there are definitely seven deacons in the Book of Acts, I think most of us would say yes there definitely are until we look at the passage that we're all thinking of. It's Act 6 of course where the Jerusalem church needs to provide a daily provision of food for the poor of their community and the appointment of seven men to manage it. Luke never uses the word diaconus, not in the gospel and not in Acts. A word he uses a lot is the related one, diaconia, service, serving. This provision of food is a diaconia and he uses a related verb, diaconine to serve in a number of places. We'll find both of these in this passage. The 12 apostles said, it's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to diaconine on tables. Therefore, select seven men for this task. You can see why we call these people deacons. They go on uh, though to say this, while we devote ourselves to the diaconia of the word. So both providing food and providing the word, are diaconia, serving. They're all deacons. I want to draw a parallel with a list of roles that we saw very briefly in an earlier slide, the gifts that differ from Paul in Romans 12. Can you see that I've introduced a gap between the top four and the bottom three? That's because a number of us think we could have two groups of activities here. Do you think that maybe the first four look mostly like ministry of the word, prophecy, teaching, exhorting, things that need to be done when the congregation meets together for worship? And 
does the second group of tasks look like the sort of management and provision that has to be undertaken as part of the life and structure of the movement, financial support, hospitality, administration? And if that's right, can you see the correspondence it's with the two types of ministry and acts, provision of the word and provision of material needs? These were ministries that were both always needed from very near the start. And they still are. Our parish priests have responsibilities for teaching and preaching, and they also have responsibility for running a small business for administration and provision of needs. What we don't get in the New Testament is the idea that all of these should all fall singly on the same person. They're shared and collective. That's one of the thoughts that might come from this short overview. But first, let's follow up the uses of diakonos because Paul does use this word, hurrah, we've got deacons in the New Testament. Uh, we translate most of the uses of diakonos as servant, not deacon, because it doesn't usually mean the title of a particular church officer. So we have servant of Christ, we are your servants, etc. It's frequent. But Paul uses diakonos twice in the sense of an officer, the, the church role. And we usually translate that as deacon. One of the times is in that verse that we've seen, where he mentions overseers plural in Philippi. Like bishops and like presbyters, calling them deacons doesn't mean that they did then what our deacons do now. The other instance is where uniquely he named the person, a person as, as a deacon. Phoebe has a role in the congregation at Kencrei. It's one of the ports of Corinth. What he goes on to say is that she has been a prostatist, that's translated benefactor uh, here in the NSV. And that characterizes her as one of the people engaged in things like financial support and hospitality, probably. That's the second set of ministries in the Romans list, according to my division of them. Is that what deacons did? But Paul's reason for mentioning her in the last part of the letter of the Romans is because it's Phoebe who's going to take this letter from Corinth to the congregations in Rome. The person who carried a letter was usually the person who read it out. Do you imagine, as I do, that when she read it out in each congregation, <laughs> they would have questions? We have questions when we read the, the letter to the Romans. Phoebe must have been the first commentator on the letter to the Romans, answering their questions. This makes her, at the very least, a trusted teacher in Paul's network. It shows us perhaps that those groups of tasks weren't watertight categories. A diakonos might host and administer but also might have the gifts of teaching and preaching, not necessarily as part of their diaconal role. Back to our summary, six references to deacons, only two before the later structures of the pastoral letters and not used in reference to the Jerusalem church, but serving is universal and takes many forms. When we see the evidence in summary form for our holy orders in the scriptures and looking perhaps a little bit bleak, we might want to make a slightly different statement from the Book of Common Prayer. I would put it positively, but I, I would put it differently from that preface. Something like this, there is evidence for the various origins from which those orders developed in scripture. But different things were happening in different places, different times. And what we have now is not simply what they did back then. I'd like to ask a different question about ministries in the New Testament. And we've been asking uh, what these ministers were called because these roles eventually give us the names of our ordained orders. Let's ask instead, what were these people doing? It's a big question, lots of things we don't know. But I started asking part of it with the list from Romans, where we might have service of the word as one group and organization of material needs as another. I think it would be interesting to add the other group that I speculated about, the hosts of the congregations. Nowadays, we sometimes have 
working parties for things like hospitality and financial support, if they had anything like such a working party, can you imagine them leaving out the householder? The, they don't seem to have been called by a special name or office, but they must have had a key role in administration and management for a congregation. They may individually have had the gifts to teach and preach as well. At, at Prisca and Aquila, for instance, were teachers and evangelists, as well as hosting congregations. But there's one word in that second set of ministries that I want to interrogate a bit further. It's this one, the verb lead in the English of the NOSV. In Greek, proestenai, meaning to manage or to lead, literally be put in front of. And here it's a uh, uh, proestaminos, the one leading. You've actually seen that verb before, but in passing, and probably not seeing any parallels because it wasn't translated in the same way. It was here in the list of character competences that overseers should have. An overseer must be leading or managing proestaminon his own house well. Anyone who does not know how to proestenai his own house, how will they take care of a congregation of God? Same word for deacons. Let them be those who are proestaminoi, leading, managing their own houses. More than that, hiding right in front of you is another use of the same word and another different translation. The elders are commended if they are proestotes, leading, managing well. It's translated rule in the NRSV, and that's not wrong. But this is the same word as all the others. What this might mean is that all three offices, the ones that develop into our bishop, priest and deacon, are characterised in this period by the sort of leadership and management needed to run a household. That's not to say they might not have gifts of prophecy and teaching and so on, some of them did. And an overseer in this community is expected to be able to teach. And so this is the only competence, apart from household management, that's mentioned in uh, the list of character traits. I haven't gone through it, but all the other things are about not behaving in an unruly way. But look at what's said about elders. Let elders who do the leading and management be honoured, especially those who teach and preach. That means that all the elders are engaged in management, and if they have other gifts, they may be teaching and preaching. So congregation might well be looking elsewhere, not among those leaders, for ministry of the word, for those gifted with teaching, preaching and encouragement. That's rather different from the way we do things structurally. I think what we're seeing is a developing need across some stages of the early congregations for order and organization. These were always needed from the beginning, but we're seeing in 1 Timothy an emphasis on the organizational capacities of three types of office holders, overseers, deacons, and elders. In origin, these roles are not necessarily the great preachers or ministers of the word. And in the earliest networks, the evangelists and prophets and pastors and teachers were not automatically identified with those three titles or with the structures of management. That doesn't mean that we have to mirror the same divisions of labor today, but it's part of the answer to how did we get to where we are from where we began. I'm going to summarize, reducing a complex variety into a few words, um, and I should say in a pattern that isn't uncontested in, in scholarship. But a congregation met typically in the house of a believer. Several people were evangelizing and teaching, etc. One or more people led on the financial management, etc. Some of these managers might be known as overseers and deacons or elders in some places where they were probably part of a council. At some point or some times, individual leaders get appointed to coordinate the work in places that had several congregations. That's the role that 
keeps or attracts the title overseer, the origin of bishops. The role of congregation leader then settled into the title elder presbyter, and in a number of later moves, the priestly role is part of the role of presiding. I've cut corners in this explanation, but I thought it was worth drawing out the growing imperative of order and management in a developing church, always needing, as Lovely told us 10 years ago, both local and translocal structures. I think we found in the pastoral letters a snapshot of ministries moving towards our later patterns and the same concern for order that's reflected in the ordinal. We call it ordination because it's about order. The development of structures needs order and management. At the same time, we are inheritors of the other traditions in the New Testament too, the ones that didn't focus as much on structure and management, but on the service and gifts to be offered by each believer in the household of God. I'm, I'm going to finish with the common worship ordinal, and I think you'll see why. This preface begins, the church is the dwelling place of the spirit. The whole church is summoned to witness and to work. To serve this royal priesthood, God has given particular ministries. So our newer ordinal frames the role of bishop, priest, deacon as particular ordered ministries within the whole body of believers. And all the members of the household are called and empowered to witness and to work. As we've seen, this wider patterning of service is also what is evident in Holy Scripture and from the Apostles' time. Ooh. Ooh. Have I done that right? Yes, we're back. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robert, indeed. Um, can I ask you to say half a sentence about uh, where uh, your view of orders might be deemed sacramental? I should have thought through this one. It's another of these things where one would like to be more precise. That would be a visible sign. Um, In terms of the New Testament, they are not the only things ordained by God. They're not the only roles ordained by God insofar as the gifts of the Spirit are from God, God's self. These are all, uh, all the gifts that are exercised uh, by believers, uh, uh, are given by God, or ordained includes the word order. And so that's why I emphasized, where do we seem to start needing these things to be structured? Um, I was suggesting that clearly the church uh, found a need um, to respond to that ordered way of doing things, but I don't think it has left behind those other sacramental duties, acts, vocations, and gifts that all God's people have. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I put you on the spot there, but that's yeah, a very, uh, very intriguing answer. Um, does anybody else have a question? We've got time for uh, just one or two. Liz? Yes, I'm wondering, Robert, with, with what you've just said, whether the new ordering of um, reader ministry in the Church of England is kind of going back a little bit to this, because the three strands of reader ministry focus on preaching and uh, enabling mission and that kind of thing, and leave the clergy people in the parish more to do that management. Um, I don't know whether you think there's anything in that. Well, I think it's fascinating, isn't it? Because uh, you know, do, do we see the clergy and do the clergy see themselves as primary managers? Mm. Um, I suspect not. Um, and it, I, it's, it's really about sharing ministers. Do you know what the commonest um, name 
used by Paul for any minister is. It's, uh, it's in Greek, sunegos. It means co-worker. Mm. It means the people we work with. That is more common than apostle or prophet or deacon or any of those, those terms. Fellow worker is uh, a, a, a clearly what we would will be seeing, I guess, if, if mm. those structures are also successful. It's, we need ways of acknowledging the gifts that people have and letting them exercise them, don't we? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that having another order <laughs> is is the only way to do that. Um, but uh, um, but it's better than not. Mm. Uh, Jezza, did you have a question? I did. I'm trying to make it sound intelligent, but it's not going to come out that way. I'm thinking about Melchizedek, King of Salem, the Most High Priest, and he institutes the bread and wine. I wondered how, as that. Does that fit into any the, anything that you've told us today, going back to Genesis? What, what the writers of the New Testament were doing, and the early Christians, were searching through Scripture and saying, how do we understand what it is that has happened? And occasionally they come across fantastic insights. Um, and one of them, of course, is the fact that Christ is both the one who makes the sacrifice and he is the sacrifice, the priest and the victim. And that's that's really core to an awful lot of our expression uh, about what it is that God has done in Christ. Um, and once you've made that leap, you start thinking, oh, well, look, Melchizedek was a priest. No, we've got this setting out of the bread and, and wine. So you kind of, you know, they made links and understood more of what it might be. But they're really kind of images and analogies um, to help with that. It's not as central as that idea of Christ is our high priest, I, I think. And, of, and, you know, extraordinarily, the victim as well as the priest is that, is mm. that, is, is why priests now don't, don't, aren't actually making a new sacrifice. Uh, Jane, Jane Jones. Sorry. To go back to what you were saying about the co-workers, Robert, uh, just remind, I was thinking about the cathedral where we have lots and lots of volunteers, hundreds of volunteers, who share in the management, the hospitality, the serving, the teaching. Um, and you know, that we see ourselves, I'm, I'm a volunteer, I'm not ordained at all, but we do see ourselves as having a ministry, which is albeit secondary to the clergy, the ordained clergy, but it's exactly what you were saying about the co-workers. And it's very encouraging to, to think that, some, that Paul sort of anticipated that. I mean, we are part of a huge body of people who share in that ministry. Yes, yeah, not so much Paul anticipated. We're finally catching up with Paul. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I would say, yes, isn't it fantastic how cathedrals uh, can do this? Actually, quite a lot of our large uh, city churches can do extraordinary things collectively and how very, very difficult that is in rural areas. Uh, I... I um, I live part of the time in, in Cornwall and in Kerry Deanery, they're planning to have in the whole deanery two full-time ordained ministers and and run all the other churches. And there are many in, in other ways. Um, you know, we're really having to uh, rethink who we train and who we pay to keep both management structures and ministries. Uh, going and I don't think we're being quite imaginative enough yet uh, to cope part with the, the, those situations. Part of the reason why it's so heavily um, leaning towards the older generation uh, is because we're not paid, we're, we're retired and we've got our pensions and so we don't need to be paid and that, yeah. that, that does sway it rather in terms and, of the age demographic. And in rural areas the number of churches that are kept going by retired clergy is an astonishing yeah. number. Yeah. Yeah, Jackie, can we finish with your question, please? And as brief as possible. Um, thank you. It was very interesting. Um, I, I sort of have joined the Society of Friends tradition, which went back to having elders and overseers. Um, and uh, that, I think, gives you uh, that sort of group feel of the early church but has other disadvantages probably um, I, 
at the moment, we're having to rethink the term overseer because of its other connotations with slavery, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I just wondered if uh, any, you saw any influences like that at all in, in you know, your research on the early church, you know, whether some terms were used you know, rather than others, because of how else they were used. Well, that's that's a complex question. Um, you know, um, we call Jesus Lord. Uh, there are there were many other people called Lord uh, in 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 the uh, empire. The thing I'd really like to pick up from what you've said is that overseer is quite often co um, connected in the. Um, in our text with the image of shepherding. So Jesus is shepherd and overseer. Um, and uh, what one has oversight is, is the flock of God. So it's um, that, that shepherding, that is why, it's why bishops carry shepherd's crooks, uh, because of that combination. So it's about, yeah, it's important what we associate those terms with. And I, I certainly think we sometimes need to find other ones and recognize that the way we translate them in in the Bible is, is contextual. It depends. Thank you very much. And thank <laughs> you very much, Robert, for a very stimulating uh, overview of these very complicated issues uh, and your uh, closing remarks on uh, the common worship uh, ordinal uh, with its insistence on baptism is a, a wonderful segue for next <laughs> time's talk where Loveday will be talking to us uh, on baptism, the water of life. Uh, so thank you ever so much. And I hope to see many of you uh, next week for Love Day Alexander. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.